So thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I feel uh, very honoured uh, amongst all these uh, luminaries. Um, so <coughs> I think one of the uh, reasons that I first became interested in trying to uh, promote uh, clear, plain English legal um, uh, writing is because the, when I joined Kennedy's, as you'll see our tagline there, our uh, advertising slogan, whatever you want to call it, is legal advice in black and white. <coughs> so we set ourselves up as doing that, providing clear, concise advice. And in fact, we, we follow that by saying we don't use jargon and we don't use caveats and we don't sit on the fence and we provide advice. Uh, and so if we're going to say that <coughs> in our marketing materials, then we'd, uh, we'd better deliver. Um, so just an overview here. thought I'd talk a little bit about why legal language is so complicated. I don't profess to be any sort of an expert on that, and I know Christoph has already sort of touched on it. But from my perspective as a practitioner, I wanted to try and understand that so I could then go on and talk to the lawyers within my firm, particularly the more junior lawyers, and say, look, this is the hill that we've got to climb. This is the problem. Um, I then wanted to go on to talk a little bit about why is it that lawyers do, and they do, draft documents that are so difficult to read? What, what is it that, that has resulted in, in that? And particularly, we've already referred to, to legalese, which uh, um, we see all the time. And then, rather ambitiously, I just wanted to think about you know, whether we could change things for the better and some of the, some of the problems, some of the impediments there are to, to doing so. So legal language, um, again, I think it's almost a sub-language, isn't it? Uh, it's not the normal language that we use every day. There are reasons for that. And these are some of the, the hallmarks of, of how we recognize legalese. Um, in terms of art, although I would suggest that there aren't many, really. People always use that as a defense and say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's the, the tools of our trade as lawyers. You know, you have to use these things. I don't think there are actually very many. Um, we go the other way, we give ordinary words unusual meanings, and I think that definitely doesn't aid comprehension. Lack of punctuation is something which I find amazing, that anyone could have thought that the absence of punctuation, the purpose of which is to aid comprehension, the absence of that is in some way meant to mean that the thing is more comprehensible. I used to work for a partner who, reading his letters, was like stream of consciousness. You know, it was like reading Jane Austen. There were so many things, so many ideas packed into one sentence, uh, into one paragraph. Um, and heaven forbid he should ever put a, a heading in. Okay, so again, we've all seen these as words, these, these uh, in examples of these doublets and triplets. You know, we do like to use two words where one would do. We like to use three words, if at all possible. So there are reasons for that in terms of how law developed. Uh, I won't bore you with it, but essentially trying to cover both English and French terms, Latin terms, and th that's historically, that's the reason for that. But those reasons have long ceased to apply. This wonderful, passive, archaic word order that we seem to, we seem to love as lawyers, and then the, the pronouns that we use, the same, the said, the sometimes. Uh, it, it, somehow thinking that these make what we write easier to understand, and they, they certainly don't. Uh, so definitely people do hate legal writing. I mean, I think there's so much anecdotal evidence of that. Just put up a study here, which I managed to find, which definitely, you know, the results of that study are absolutely, you know, it is not easy to understand traditional legal writing. So there's a problem, uh, and I would <coughs> ask how we fix it. Not an easy question. I don't know where to point this thing. So again, we're supposed to be problem solvers, so I don't understand why we haven't tried to address this as practitioners, why we haven't recognized it. Um, we certainly, given that this symposium is about audience, we certainly need to understand that audience is key here and that we aren't writing for lawyers, we're writing for the user, the reader of that document. Um, and the second point there in terms of lawyers just have this obsession with making things compre uh, comprehensive at the expense of comprehensible. We think we have to put, cover every single eventuality. Uh, maybe it's the way we're taught, or historically we're taught. I hope it's not the case now. And we have to understand that you know, bespoke legal writing is very different from precedent. And we can do a lot with precedent, but that takes time and it takes effort. And sometimes we just don't have the luxury. And we need to remember the context. Again, this was touched on before in terms of one of the things I always 
discuss with the junior lawyers in our firm is what is it that you're writing? You know, you have to have a different approach depending upon what it is. Um, so, you know, we're not writing academic journals. <coughs> so many times young lawyers will come to me and it will have, you know, footnotes in it. What's, it's a letter to a client, you know, it's a letter to a lay client. Uh, and they just can't understand that that's different from when they were at university or law school. Even then I would query the use of those sorts of things. Um, I wouldn't profess to talk about judicial writing, that's for other people to talk about. I wouldn't profess to, to be any sort of a statutory draftsman. But what I do do is I, I, I draft contracts. And I always try and remember that I'm recording the agreement between the parties. I'm not just taking things from other contracts. I had a very, very, very good assistant who produced an absolutely fantastic, fantastic loan agreement. And it had a brilliant guarantee clause in it. But there wasn't a guarantor. So, again, I think it's got to make sense within the context of what it is that you're doing. Advisory as well, communicating with clients. Um, there's a very different style, I think, from writing to the other side. If you're in litigation, writing to your client, writing to a general counsel, writing to the finance director or chairman of the board, or whoever it is. We need to understand that. So, again, a little touched on why it's so complicated. I just believe you know, it is complicated. We have to recognize that. I don't <coughs> profess to know the depth of that, but you know, we're trying to deal with difficult legal concepts, difficult life concepts. Um, and again, why do we need to spend so much time at law school learning to think and write like a lawyer? Is that because we're a special case? Do we really communicate in different ways to other people? I don't think so. I don't think we should. And again, I would hope that we can simplify some legal language uh, so that it does, as I say, mean what it says and says what it means. We get the blame, don't we? Lawyers definitely get the blame. <coughs> and I think the primary reason we get the blame is people say, well, you're just creating work for yourself. You know, so I have to pay a lawyer to understand this. It's a job creation idea. And I think most, most people would say, yeah, yeah, I, th I think there's probably some truth in that. I don't believe there is. I don't believe it's as, as targeted as that. I believe it's much more the second one here. You're writing almost for the wrong audience. You're writing for other lawyers. Uh, you're not writing for the audience. Um, you're drafting, as I say here, for some mythical judge who may one day pour over your contract, uh, pour over your advice if we're talking about professional liability. And so you write for that person. You don't write for the person you should be. Complexity, again, that's another reason that people put forward. So this is really complex stuff, you know, I, I can't make it simple. It's really difficult and there's, there's exceptions and there's this and there's that and the other. And yes, of course, there often, it, there often are, but learning some techniques, which increasingly I'm seeing the, uh, the law schools teach, as to how to structure those sorts of things. I think that, I am seeing improvement in that. And I think it is, it is because the universities, the law schools are working on that. And again, as I say, we shouldn't really have to have a flow chart to understand particularly legal advice. This is a unit of truth problem. Uh, again, this is uh, looking at why it is that this is the case. This is something that I came up with, which is that lawyers think that they have to cram everything. The, the whole concept that they're trying to get across has to go into one sentence. And I spent a lot of time talking to more junior lawyers saying, one idea, one sentence. Okay? Use two sentences. What, what, why is that somehow felt to be less loyally to use two sentences, less erudite, less forceful. Fear and laziness, something lawyers, of course, never suffer from. <coughs> um, use of precedence, again, we get this all the time. As I use that example of the one where there was a beautiful guarantee but no guarantor. Um, and also this inability to change things in a precedent because it's in there, it's written in stone. It must be right for all eventualities. And so we see a lot of that. Um, and that's difficult to, to, to counter, I think. Pride, I do think that lawyers like to sound loyally. We like to sound like, you know, well, hey, we know what we're talking about. We like to sound like some, some judge, maybe. I, I don't think that we should, but um, I think that pride is a, is a real reason for, for why we produce the sort of written work that we do. Um, <coughs> convention and habit, again, it's just always the way that we've done it. Um, lawyers, I say, very good at bad drafting. You know, we're good at this stuff. You know, we can understand it. Um, other people can't, but, you know, who cares, right? <coughs> um, no, I don't think that is going to work in, in the commercial environment that we have today as, as a law firm. The pressures that we have, no one's crying for lawyers, of course, but the commercial pressures that we have mean that we have to differentiate our advice 
from other advice. And I think, you know, making sure it's clear, understandable, that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's something that we can do. This is a quote from Justice Ricks. Um, you cannot rely on the old forever. You cannot keep on patching from time to time. You have to have a proper overhaul. Um, and that is what this plain English movement has been about for some time now. If you do not carry out that overhaul, then the risk of simply carrying on in the old way is greater than the risk of undertaking the new. That's a quote from Justice Ricks in Clarity. Um, and there was another article by Christopher Hafner in that, that very article. There you go. I found that as well, Christopher. So there you go. Uh, and Clarity, very uh, laudable organization, uh, promoting plain legal language. And that's, there's a, a reference there. Um, again, just quickly go through these. Too many cooks. Certainly with contracts, we get this batting between two lawyers uh, we get my style, we get the, the other side style, we get the client style. Uh, it's a bit of a mismatch. Um, <coughs> we often find contracts have been taken from two or three different precedents, two or three different contracts. No one's gone through them, made sure all the defined terms are the same. They're just very, very difficult to understand. One of my absolute bugbears <coughs> is people that define terms in a contract. The reason you define a term in a contract is so you put somewhere the definition to aid in the understanding of it. But there isn't. You look for a definition, there isn't one there because it's been taken from a different contract or somebody's forgotten it. Uh, and that's just, I, I hate that because it just creates so much ambiguity. I mentioned before, I think expense is one of the reasons why we, we haven't got the luxury of doing this. There are commercial presses, pressures on lawyers and it's very rare to have the luxury, as I say, of being able to say, I'm going to start with a clean piece of paper. I'm going to start and draft the best plain English contract. We, we, we don't really often have that. Lawyers love the legalese. Some quotes here about what it is, but I think we all, we all recognize it when we see it. I like the very sexist term for the, the last one there, in conversation with his wife, of course. These are, these are old quotes. We wouldn't be allowed to say such things now. So... It is the traditional way of writing. Legalese is, is it, and, and we've got to counter that. It's cluttered, it's wordy, it's indirect. We, we, we all know those things. Very complicated sentence structures, impersonal, wordy, as I say, outdated grammar, perusal, passive voice, double negatives. We don't need no double negatives, is what I always say to my, uh, <laughs> say to my students. Jargon, lawyers love it. I'm an insurance lawyer. Insurers love jargon. I've got a double whammy here, you know? Um, Okay, I won't go through these. Uh, yeah, I was thinking if, if legalese was so good, you know, we'd be out of a job, but, uh, but we're not. Can we cure it? Yeah, I'm sure you're all aware of the plain English stuff. Again, I won't go through it in any detail, but there's an interesting bullet point there. Second, a legal writing style that does not vary from task to task or audience to audience. I'm not sure... One of the things we're considering in this symposium is that it should vary from audience to audience. So I, I certainly don't agree with that statement, but it is one that I found when looking at what, what is meant by plain legal English. Uh, I like the third bullet point more there in terms of clear, concise, clear, correct, concise, complete. You have to have the C's, don't you? If you had one that didn't have a C, you'd have to make it sort of fit in with those. Uh, again, I won't do very much on these because I think we all know it. I wanted to get on to talk a little bit... Uh, about insurance. Yes, very exciting subject. So again, <coughs> if law is seen as difficult to understand, complicated, insurance is, is equally seen as something which is, you know, opaque, impenetrable in terms of insurance contracts. I think the other thing people think about insurance contracts is all that stuff in the insurance contract is there so your insurer doesn't have to pay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a general perception of, of what insurance contracts do, what insurance lawyers do. They are going to draft these contracts so there are so many exceptions, so many caveats in them that, you know, you'll never get your money at the end of the day. That's something that we really have to counter against. Uh, and so I think those sorts of contracts are ones where people have said, OK, well, let's try and make sure these are drafted in a, in a more easily understandable way. So 44 of 50 states... Some form of requirement for insurance contracts, this is in the US, to be written in plain English. Uh, in Hong Kong, there's less of a statement about that, but there is a statement in terms of uh, uh, we should produce sales materials in plain language uh, and we should use plain language uh, when asking questions in the proposal form. And that's important for insurance because insurance contracts are contracts of, of utmost good faith and that works both ways. So there is this obligation on an insurer 
to actually make their contracts understandable because they do owe duties to the policyholder. Uh, and if you've got some insurance contracts recently or you've been an insomniac and wanted to send yourself to sleep and have read them, that's the reason why we now start to see this use of the first person pronouns in, in insurance contracts, we and you and us, and we do this all the time. And they're supposed to make the contract easier to understand because the first person viewpoint is, is supposed to aid the comprehension of them. And we also use some other tactics to try and aid understandability, shorter sentences, we group the exceptions together in a big thing that says, we use things like, we will cover X, we won't cover Y. If you want to make a claim, this is what you've got to do. We need these documents, you need to send them by then. And there's a real move to, to try and do that. Um, the main commercial terms, how much your cover is, who the insureds are, we put those in a schedule. So, and we try and avoid use of technical terms. So we're really trying to, you know, do some things, adopt these techniques to make those sorts of contracts more understandable. Okay. Um, Again, I just sort of finish on these sorts of points. Uh, it's not just for altruistic reasons. I mean, it's good business as far as we're concerned. We have clients who come back to us and say, do you know what? I was really surprised. I understood your advice. Um, and they are surprised. And, <laughs> you know, that says, says a lot, I think. Um, judges certainly prefer it. Um, you know, one of my fears is a judge complains about my contract wording and says it was bad and he didn't understand it. And, you know, I'm at fault because I've created the dispute. It creates work for my litigation partners, of course, but that's not the idea. So plain language, we would say, definitely leads to less disputes. Um, uh, there's some slides here, which are, I think, in the, in the pack on uh, consumer contracts. Again, there's a big move to ensure that consumer contracts, because they are consumers, uh, are drafted in, in plain English. Um, and there's a recent case here uh, in the uh, European case uh, to say not only did these, this stuff apply to insurance contracts, um, <coughs> but that to satisfy um, the requirement of the unfair terms in consumer contracts, the European regulation, um, the contract had to be drafted in plain, intelligible language to comply with that. And I think goes even further to say, what does intelligible mean? It means that whoever's reading it can understand the consequences of it. And I think that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, there's a couple of slides here on uh, law access in Australia, which I think is a very good example of something where people are trying to uh, promote the use of, of uh, plain English. Uh, and I like the quote at the end, there, which is effectively it's a, si a, a website telling people how they can draft their own legal documents, but does conclude with, there's no, no need to write like a lawyer. And in fact, it was one of the things you put up on your slide, you know, how, how to write like a lawyer. I actually, when I lecture to, to, to the, the, um, the trainees, say this is how not to write like a lawyer because so many people think that writing like a lawyer means using all that jargon. So in summary, no right or wrong. I think it's a matter of style. Certainly what we teach, we have a, a firm style and we make sure that the junior lawyers understand our approach to, to, to those sorts of things. Um, but I always finish off when I'm talking to those students saying, understand what it is that you're trying to say, because until you do that, you have no hope whatsoever of distilling that down into advice for a client. So you've got to focus on that first. How, if you understand, then you have a hope of, uh, of making sure that the client understands. Audience, again, I always say to them, who are you writing to? Understand where you fit in in terms of our business. You might be producing a memo for me, but I've got to take that memo, turn it into a letter of advice for the client, the client then takes that, maybe I send it to the general counsel, he's got a board member he's got to take it to, understand the context that what we're doing is part of that chain. You know, the advice that we produce doesn't just disappear into the ether, it's used for some purposes. So understand that, and then you understand the audience all the way up. Um, and again, I think you've, you've touched on some of this, Christoph, in terms of trying to identify facts, concepts, answers. Um, I think that the last two, lawyers just love to put stuff in to prove that they understand it or, or that they're interested in it. You know, a lot of the juniors, oh, I was really interested in that bit, so I thought I'd put it in. You know, it's like they go off on a little run for their own and then come back to the main thing, you know. And I like that in a way because I like lawyers who are interested in the law. There are a few of us. Uh, so it's good, but it's useless within the context of what it is that you're trying to, to do for the client. And finally, you know, we, we repeat this all the time. Use plain English avoid jargon and legalese, but uh, we have a lot of work to do to, to
to ensure that uh, they do that. Thank you. <laughs>